YouTube doesn't tell you when my new videos are out unless you click that notification button and you're subscribed. So be sure to do that. And please click the like button, guys, to keep this channel growing. Thank you. Check out this bizarre and chilling video of a creature seen in a sewer system in the UK by a water company known as United Utilities. Is it a prank or is it real? You're watching Darkness Prevails, the best channel to share your creepy stories with the world because this world is a strange one. Sewers are filled with nasty things, some of which are alive and still walking around. Here are five allegedly true scary stories of the creepy things encountered in sewers. If you want your story in a future video, send me your scary stories at darknessprevails.org slash submit. I'm looking for stories about Amazon warehouse workers or UPS drivers. Now then, prepare your gag reflex. Number one, the worst way to go submitted by Goff Daily. It was 14 years ago in the summer of 2004. My father worked at the wastewater treatment plant in Spokane, Washington, which was built along the Spokane River. A few hundred feet above the plant, some high-end real estate was built to take advantage of the view of Riverside State Park. The owners of these homes would occasionally call and complain that the treatment plant looked dirty and whatnot, leading plant management to ask the maintenance staff to clean off the tops of the anaerobic digesters. These are concrete silos that are used in breaking down human waste in a low air environment. The weekend before the incident, my parents were out of town camping and my dad, nicknamed Gino, decided to call in sick that Monday to take an extra day off and enjoy being away from it all with his family. That Monday, the plant had received a few calls about the look of the top of the digesters and a crew of three guys was told to clean them off. Now, before I go on, I need to explain a few things about the digesters so you can understand what happened. These sewage tanks were built in the 1960s and 1970s and as the sludge was broken down, it would be pumped out of the bottom of the tank, then it would be further processed. The system was designed to handle the waste of a city, with fewer people connected to the sewer system that had been added by the 2000s. As time passed, the increased load of processing waste wasn't always monitored well, and more waste was dumped into the sewage tanks than it could handle. When this happened, the air pocket that was needed for the anaerobic bacteria to do its job would foam up, filling the tank to the very top. Another thing about these tanks is the domed tops. They weren't designed to be walked on. So on that beautiful and fateful summer day, three men were on top of one of the anaerobic digester tanks, cleaning and scrubbing it off so the people of the hill wouldn't complain about the terrible view. Things were going fine and normal until the worst thing that could happen happened. The dome collapsed, dropping the three men into a thick gray mess of partially processed human body waste. Worse yet, the suction from the pumps was pulling them down into the sludge. Two of the men were able to be rescued and rushed to the hospital to be treated they remained in a coma for several days. But the third man, my father's best friend and fishing buddy, was nowhere to be found. The sewage tank had cracked, spilling toxic human waste into the Spokane River, and the city government went into full gear to prepare for the literal crap storm it was going to face. The third man, Mike Simosis, his body wasn't recovered for another week, he had been pulled down to the bottom of the sewage and drowned in the most awful and vile of liquids. Mike's passing was described in a civil suit against Spokane City government, as well as the senior plant management, describing his final moments as painful and terrifying as his lungs and mouth filled with processed sewage, burning his lung tissue and ending him rather slowly. 
After one of the other two men recovered enough to talk, he told my father that one of the last things he heard Mike say was, you know, if Gino was here, we wouldn't be doing this crap. The two survivors still suffer chronic health issues like emphysema to this day. The city tried to get out of as much blame for the accident as they could, and they tried to protect the plant's senior management. The civil suit proved otherwise to a level of extreme incompetence by the plant management. A number of my dad's co-workers and his manager were forced to retire shortly after, and due to the danger and corruption of the job, my dad decided to quit early. My father still struggles at times with the guilt of not being there to keep everyone safe, but now a statue of Mike Simosis and his daughter fishing were erected in his memory and still sits in front of the plant. None of this had to happen though. It all happened because corrupt management caved in to a bunch of people who thought their beautiful site had been spoiled by a necessary piece of infrastructure. Number two, Devil in the Pipes, submitted by Nicholas M. It was a dark and very windy night in October. I was out trick-or-treating with my friends. We had a little bit too much to drink that night. My friend, let's call him Mike, thought it would be a good idea to go into the sewer systems. He thought it'd be fun and freaky. Being drunk, my other friend Dan and I went with the idea. Not even once considering all the things that could go wrong, and there were many, we found a rather large opening in one of the water drainage areas on the road. Then we lowered ourselves down. It was difficult to see how far down it went, and at first I was afraid I was going to hurt myself, and it turned out not to be so far down. We started exploring and eventually got lost, but in spite of the smell, we were in fact enjoying ourselves. We began to sober up soon and began to grow aware of where we actually were. It was around that time we saw a breaking light in the distance. We thought it was morning that the sun was shining through one of the openings in the drainage. At least we thought it was sunlight. We began to walk towards the light, thinking it was a way out, when we heard this odd and terrible sound, like a sharp nails on glass screeching. Mike began to freak out. Now that he was more sober, his claustrophobia was setting in. Plus, none of us really wanted to confront the source of that strange noise. Mike kept screaming. We're going to die down here, guys. It became his fearful chant as he said it over and over again. I was getting frustrated between the screeching, the light, and Mike's incoherent screaming. As Mike continued to freak out, the screeching was drawing closer by the second. As we waited, the screeching sounded as if it was right in our ears. Then, just around the corner behind us, we saw something horrifying, something we never would have expected. It was a humanoid shape rounding the corner. Any sane person would think immediately, oh, someone else had the same idea, or maybe it's someone who works in the sewers. It took me a few moments to realize that it may have looked human in shape, but it was not a person. It was about half the height as a normal person, around three feet tall, but its build was thick, like some sort of short bodybuilder. I know it's a weird and almost funny sounding comparison, but it's the only thing I could compare it to. Maybe it was real, or maybe I was just hallucinating from the sewer waste and from the drinks that remained in my body. But my friends apparently saw it too, and at the same time, we all booked it away. We managed to find an exit quickly and made it back under the streets, back to safety. Of course, we did look back down to see if it had chased us, and Nick and I swear we saw those glowing red eyes looking back and a wide body to go with it. I don't know what we saw that night, but I can say for certain, whether that creature was real or not, playing around in the sewers is a terrible idea. Number three, it lives in the sewers, 
submitted by WebBN. My name is Mark. I've always been that kind of scared guy, so calling me a coward or something like that it doesn't really do much to me. I've accepted it. I lived in a town called Shivarp in the good old Sweden. Now, my family isn't the biggest one. It's just me, my mom, and dad. Shivarp was a good and calm little town, and there wasn't really anything to be afraid of. However, in the summer of 2013, they said in the newspaper that several people had reported hearing strange noises coming from the sewers. All of the reports came from nearby, and it was kind of unsettling. Near my home was a small lake called Ochitana. Near that lake was a big hole built into a small hill that leads to the sewers. The lake is relatively calm and very warm, so seeing people come down for a swim is not rare. It was said that a lot of kids who had gone close to that hole, though, they said that they could hear something akin to roaring and growling, as if something lived in the sewers. Since that day, when the sounds were first reported, many people wanted to explore the place. However, one man that had actually entered the sewers had disappeared, and to this day, he was never found. The police even had to set up blockades not allowing anyone to enter the sewers, keeping the town safe from whatever lay inside. But one night, when I was searching for some scary stories on my computer, my phone rang. I picked it up and answered with a yes. It was my friend Omar. He sounded excited. He was saying things like the police had a very good reason they blocked off the sewer and there was a good reason they left the sewers open like that, even though it was obviously very dangerous for the public. Then he explained to me what he was planning. He wanted to go into and explore the sewers, wanting to find proof that something or someone was in there. I told him that that was a very bad idea. I was afraid that something lurking in the sewers was going to take him, exactly what happened to the man before. He tried to calm me down, saying there was probably nothing to be scared of, that it's probably just rumors. If anything, it was maybe a bear or a deer that entered the sewers looking for food or something. Maybe they got lost, and even if they were deep inside the sewers, the sounds they made would echo all the way to the entrance. He may have been right. There were vast forests surrounding the hole and the lake, and of course, they were full of these types of animals. It wasn't uncommon to see them going down to the lake to get a fresh drink of water. However, they were all scared of people, and from what I've seen, they avoided the hole as well, seemingly afraid of it, like we were, or like we're supposed to be. Omar didn't seem afraid. He told me that I should come with him, that it'd be more safe if two people went, and it would be more fun. I agreed to come, although I honestly didn't want to. I was pretty freaked out and scared about it. I grabbed my shoes and a flashlight, and we met just outside my house. We began to walk towards the lake, and after about half an hour, we were there. The hole was now in front of us, and we pointed our glowing flashlights to the dark insides of the hole. We soon went inside the hole, walking slowly through the sewer, the stench was terrible, but that was to be expected. What we found in there that wasn't to be expected were the claw marks, dozens upon dozens of deep gashes in the walls. They didn't look like a bear's claws, though, but I couldn't be sure. There were a few marks, though, that looked like an alligator had gotten frustrated. There were also the occasional hand marks from a person, which gave Omar and I pause. What if these were the last known markings of the man who was never found? Maybe 10 minutes into walking through the sewer, we heard a loud growl coming from in front of us. We looked ahead, and we saw two completely red eyes reflecting in the flashlight beams. And that's when we saw the entirety of the thing. A massive snout, 
filled with gigantic knife-like teeth and a reptilian body that was a dark green. It was the biggest alligator I'd ever seen. It appeared to be an alligator, but there was something very wrong with its tail. The tail looked like it had been placed in a pencil sharpener, all the skin and most of the flesh torn away from it. So, in the end, it no longer resembled the tail of a reptile, rather that of a rat, and it had the aggression and anger to match. The creature was only a few feet away from us when it let out this sound like a hiss mixed with a snarl. We slowly backed away, afraid any sudden movements would lead to our quick demise. But when it snarled again, this time so incredibly loud like a roar, it scared us something fierce and forced us out of the sewer at full speed. Luckily, it never came bounding after us. It just stood there, staring at us. When we were almost out of the sewer, the creature began to slowly back away as well until its red glowing eyes disappeared completely in the darkness. After that, we looked at each other, Omar and I. Then we ran the rest of the way back to my house. Since that day, my ears were perked up, listening to the news for any updates about the sewer. One day, it said that the police had found something horrible in there. Not too far away from the hole that led to the sewers, they found, apparently, a big but empty room. It wasn't completely empty, though. In one of those corners, they found a big pile of bloody clothes that had been ripped to smaller shreds. It was from the man who had disappeared, and we had been the same size in clothing, which especially frightened me. That was what the thing had done to someone else, and at any moment that night, that could have been us. We never heard anything more of the creature inside the sewers. The police found nothing else, but luckily no one else has disappeared, so I guess the mystery has met an unsatisfying ending and hopefully, the horror has stopped. Number four, The Sewer Basement, submitted by Harold Dilemma. I used to work for a water treatment plant. The folks that worked there were older men. It was a cushy job, just sitting at a monitor all day and making sure the acidity and turbidity levels were fine. Sometimes, though, we had to check below deck. That's what we called the downstairs pipe room area, which happened to contain a broad entrance into the sewer. We'd have to check a few gauges down there, but the sewer entry was for the actual waste team, not for the water team. Still, we had to be around it, and that was enough to give any of us, me or the old men, a good fright. The senior employees that worked there always talked of the pipe room like it was haunted, but I didn't believe that. Never believed in ghosts or any sort of that nonsense. I turned out to be wrong in one way. There was a very good reason to be scared down there, and I would soon discover why. I worked the night shift, and it was a relatively warm night. My coworker was late for his shift, as he often was. At night, it was only two officers sitting at the monitors and running rounds. That's all we really needed here, as the job really wasn't very high maintenance. That night, I was expected to do the gauges, so I decided to just get it over with. Whether my coworker was here or not, I'd rather just get it done than come back up to the main room and sit down. I grabbed my clipboard, and I took the old elevator down to the basement level. That darned thing was really scary, shaking mercilessly as you went down at a snail's pace. I thought that would be the worst of it, but I was wrong. When the elevator door and screen opened up, the gauge room had its usual lack of charm. The musty smell, the occasional drip of condensation from the pipes, and the low echoing hum coming from the sewer system. It was the opposite of beauty, but it was my job after all. I slowly stepped off the elevator and made my way opposite the direction of the sewer entrance, and there sat the hub for the gauges. 
as I wrote down the numbers measured at the time. From the gauges I had to inspect, I suddenly began to hear a sound that sent chills up my spine. It was footsteps. They were coming up from behind me, footsteps that sounded like they were coming from the sewer. I turned around slowly, constantly saying in my head, there's no way, no way this is real. Things like this don't happen. Despite my disbelief, the steps only drew closer until whatever was in the sewer was seconds away from coming to the exit and walking into the pipe room. Why didn't they bother to place a cover or gate on the thing, I wondered, as I ran over to one of the pillars and hid behind it. As I hid, the steps came out of the sewer. It was then that I knew I was no longer alone in the basement. I could now hear a strange grunting sound, followed by heavy and raspy breathing. Then there was a heavy thud, followed by the nastiest gnashing and chewing noises I'd ever heard. Wet, ripping sounds. I leaned out from behind the pillar, and that's when I saw him. It looked like the filthiest, homeless man you can imagine. Most of his skin was exposed, as the clothes he had on hardly existed anymore. In fact, some of the tatters of his clothing appeared to be fused with his skin, as if they had melded with it from years of wearing the clothing. Then I saw in his hand what appeared to be a large rat. It was still writhing and kicking and trying to get free of the homeless man's grasp, even though half of the rat's stomach and midsection were gone, being chewed in the mouth of the man. Bite after bite, he ate the sewage-soaked rat alive. I'd had as much as I could take. I stepped from around the pillar with a, what the heck do you think you're doing here? And the moment I did, the man dropped on all fours, startled and still holding the rat. He literally growled at me like some kind of animal. Many of his teeth were missing, but the teeth that were still there told me that if he did in fact bite me, I'd probably get a very dangerous case of sepsis and it would be better to avoid any conflict with this guy. Still, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. In a split moment, I took off to the elevator. I pressed the up button and I looked behind me. Now, the man was only inches from me, still on all fours. He hadn't even made a sound. I nearly screamed, but I held it in. Instead, I kicked at the man. He backed away, still growling. This guy was positively insane. Luckily, he simply stared as I climbed aboard the elevator. And that was the last I saw of him. I reported the incident to management, and though no one believed me and everyone laughed at me, they did end up sealing the sewer off with a gate that required a key to access, and only the waste team would have the key. But why hadn't they done that earlier? This was an experience I won't ever forget. And wouldn't you know it, I still work at the water treatment plant. And number five, The Septic Nightmare, submitted by Carol. This is a short yet very horrifying experience I had as a child. When I was younger, I was bullied constantly by a group of boys in my school. They didn't like me, of course. The idea of a young girl being half Native American didn't sit well with them, and they would let me know about it every chance they got. Sometimes they'd even follow me home. I couldn't outrun them and the folks that passed by would ignore it. It was honestly a living hell. On my way home, I had to pass over this bridge. Underneath it, there was a small stream that babbled through. There was also a manhole down there, just above the water. A terrible place for a manhole, as you'll soon see. Kids often played there, and often tried to lift the manhole cover to get inside. 
but from what I'd seen before, the kids weren't strong enough to lift it. Well, one day, these bullies did the absolute worst to me. They knocked me from my back, dragged me under the bridge, and they managed to lift the manhole cover because one of them had actually brought a crowbar. This told me that the boys had been planning this. Once the hole was opened up, they shoved me into the manhole so quickly, I wasn't able to latch onto anything, such as the metal rungs that were built into the side of the wall. So, instead, I hit the bottom of the sewer, hard, sewage nearly coming up to my mouth. I passed out a few moments later, and due to the way I hit my head. While I was passed out, it began to rain. I know this because, when I woke up, I was choking on sewage, and the water was rising fast as the stream was overflowing and leaking into the manhole. With my head bleeding and dizzy, I climbed the ladder and I tried to push it up, but I couldn't. I was a small girl. I couldn't even manage to make it budge. So, with the worst taste in my mouth, surrounded by human waste, I thought I was going to drown in it. But miraculously, and luckily, a nearby homeless man heard my screams as he had tucked himself away under the bridge when the rain started. That man, with all the strength he had, was able to remove the cover and pull me back to safety. He carried me to the hospital as I kept fading in and out of consciousness. That man saved my life. I still have the scar on the back of my head from that incident, but it is both a positive and negative reminder. I mean, sure, people are capable of horrible, disgusting acts, but there are people who are also capable of immeasurable acts of kindness. Whenever I feel the itch or sting on the back of my head from that scar, I choose rather to remember the old man, the man who had saved me from that awful fate the man who carried me a mile in the rain to the hospital. Good God, everybody. If you can avoid it, stay out of the sewers. It's infested with all sorts of bacteria that probably want to eat you alive. Not to mention people flush all kinds of critters down there. And then there's tons of rats, I'm sure. It's positively a dangerous place in every regard. So if you want to avoid a very stinky fate, stay out of the sewers and go spray yourself with some cologne, you filthy animal. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Don't forget, you can send me your stories and maybe even appear in a future video. I'm looking for stories about Amazon warehouse workers and UPS drivers. If you've got one, send it to me at darknessprevails.org slash submit. If you want to support my channel further, you can always donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash darknessprevails. With one buck a month, you get your name in the credits at the end of these videos. Or if you get a little bit of extra cash, go to morbidmonsters.com and get some really cool shirts. If you want to support me for free, you can find all my videos and stories in one little app called Spooked. You can get it for free on Google Play. Now then, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video about five school lockdown stories. Rashawn Ferguson says, Hey, finally I got first. I'm so happy. I love your vids, dude. Seriously. You're awesome. You're a natural storyteller. Thank you. I actually finally got a real life comment about that the other day. It made me feel good. Paradox Box says, You are the ocean's gray waves. Paradox, I love ya, but get off the crack. Or maybe you're just an underappreciated poet. Amar Original says, Wow, this is great for finals and stuff. Thanks, pal, for a procrastination excuse. It's not procrastination if you major in nightmares. Kawaii Ale says, Please make some merch. I've got tons of it. It's all at morbidmonsters.com and features some of your favorite monsters from these stories, as well as other cool Darkness Prevails things. And Michael Pelzer says, Just get the Wolverine to be your bodyguard. Nobody can touch you if you got Logan to be there. Well, except Logan. I'd love for him to touch me.
As a straight man, just look at that dude. Damn. Anyway, thanks again for watching my video. Please like the video and share wherever you can. Views are getting low, but we're still growing, so that's great. Anyone who still tunes in, and to all the donators in these patron credits, I love ya. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy.